justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. 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 Now. Fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love. Saturday Action Rally for you that are here at the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem. And for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, and you that are watching us live stream around the country, we're happy to be with you another Saturday morning where the action is. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. And give a hand to our inspirational preacher this morning, Reverend Christopher Lewis. He got that little boy in that hole. I was trying to figure out where he was getting ready to go with that, but he got him out that hole, so I came on out here. We're glad to have him with us. Come off 136th Street and uh, is pastoring now in uh, Danbury. Connecticut, and we're glad about it. Let me uh, say that uh, we joined the uh, nation and people around the world in mourning the passing of Mary Wilson, yeah. of the one of the founders of the Supremes, and uh, she made her transition. And uh, as I speak, they are preparing in an hour for the funeral services of Danny Ray, who was the MC and Cape Man for God, uh, Godfather Soul James Brown for many years. If you ever watched or went to a James Brown show, he was the one that would introduce him, and he one was the one that would throw the cape on him when he went down and did please, please, please. And uh, Danny Ray was 85 years old, and uh, they're giving his services today at the James Brown Arena in Augusta, Georgia. I talked to 
Mr. Brown's uh, daughter this morning. They're on the way and playing a video message from me at the funeral. Uh, he's been, he was a uh, main uh, uncle like to me in uh, the years I was around uh, James Brown. And uh, talking about the years around James Brown, that's where me and Kathy met. A lot of folk reading all about me and Kathy. I told y'all 17 years ago to stay out our business. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm going to repeat that. But I will say this, wherever goes and whatever happens, Kathy helped build this organization and will be a leader in this organization. Give her a big hand. So all of y'all that come to see and hear and all that, that's that. She helped build this. She'll be here. Me and her have our own bond and our own understanding. So don't get in between that. We've been through more mess than a little bit. And we know your mess. And you get in my mess, I'll get your mess right on the radio. All you got is your little Facebook page with about 10 followers. I got a whole lot of followers, I'll put your mess out. So punch the fist bump the guy next to you and say, hey amen, go right there. Amen. All right, so. I also want to uh, say that, uh, of course, Gwen Carr is here as every Saturday, mother of Eric Garner. And uh, she brought her guest with her. She endorsed this week Ray McGuire for mayor, and his wife is with us, the Crystal McCrary uh, McGuire. Stand up, Crystal. This is the wife of the mayor candidate. Now she's been here before. She's been here with her, her, her children feeding on holidays and she is a filmmaker in her own right. People ask me, say, well, Ray McGuire they did a turn the times and his house and all that. I said, well, man, now both of them make a whole lot of money. He got a nice little house apartment on uh, Central Park. I go there sometimes, kick my feet back, act like rich folk, because Crystal make a lot of money. I know Crystal before she married Ray, she making big money then. Though she come out of Detroit and still with her, what, what do y'all call them, uh, uh, Dominique, your uh, Bergen bags? She, Birkin. In her Birkin bag is her Detroit switchblade now, so don't mess with it. Well, we're glad to have her with us this morning. I want us to uh, take very close attention to the proceedings in Washington. One of the things that is interesting is that many of the right-wingers, the Republicans, that have tried to castigate many of us down through the years. Now all of a sudden is doing flips, trying to justify what Trump said. The only defense that they could come with is that, well, some Democrats used the term fight too. And they played video of members of Congress and the Senate talking about fighting. What is amazing to me is none of those videos that they played where anybody was speaking whether, whether was followed up by any insurrection or violence. How you 
going to take a speech that led to nothing and compare that to a attempted coup d'etat that left the speech with the instructions of the speaker and put everybody's life in danger as they went around the building hunting down people with weapons. That's the video you need, is you need to be able to show that this speaker did, said this, and it led immediately to that. Reason they can't show that is because it never happened. You got some right wingers running around, still talking about I helped incite the Crown House riot, and I didn't get there till it was over. <laughs> but that is the propaganda that they use until it comes home to them. One of the things that is, is obviously troublesome for them is that when they were going through the Capitol building, talk about where's Nancy, trying to hunt down the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. All these hours they were going through, Congress people were calling the White House, trying to get Trump to say something, and he would not say anything to even stop it. He released a video late that evening. So not only do I feel he'll encourage it, he did not try in any way to stop it. Now, that's the fact. What they do, we don't know. They need 17 votes from Republicans and all 50 of the Democrats to get two thirds. It is unlikely that they will get the 17 votes. But it is important that they expose to the world what this man did and what it meant. And forever put those Republicans in a position where they can never distort what many of us say because now they have sanitized an outright insurrection incitement. I told them all along, the people I talked to in Washington, go with the trial and take attendance. Let everybody go on the record so you'll know exactly where they are. The other thing is that, you know, I, I, I've been one of the vociferous critics of Donald Trump down through the years since we marched on him on the Central Park case. And, but I almost felt sorry for him when I saw the lawyers he had, I ain't never, I ain't never. You know, I'm spoiled because we got Michael Hardy. But I think, I, I mean, it was almost like he had legal aid up there. They didn't know that. And I'm not the great legal aid, because I know some great legal aid of lawyers, but they weren't in Washington for Donald Trump. To play videos as a defense when five people died, don't miss the gravity of what happened. Five people died. They beat one Capitol policeman to death. And that's the way you explain that. So I want you, as we get this verdict later, for us to really understand what's at hand. The other thing I want by way of announcements is to make sure that you uh, know that Tuesday and Wednesday, the 16th and the uh, 17th, is this PBS special on the black church. And uh, this was done by Professor Henry Louis Gates and uh, Oprah Winfrey. And one of the reasons that it's important, and many of us in it, they feature a lot of uh, the development of the black church from slavery till now, and uh, how the church has been a, 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 the, a bedrock in the community. One of the reasons I want you to watch it is because a lot of people have a distorted view of the black church. 
because they get the view from folk that have never been to the black church. When you allow whites that claim to be our friends tell you we don't need the church, then you are being directed by people that don't understand what they're talking about. Many have developed, and we've always had this problem, many that develop in so-called radical movement are antithetical to the culture and history of the black community. So what brought them up does not bring us up. It's easy when you got a trust fund for you to go out and act poor. That's why I keep telling y'all, when, when uh, uh, we had the mayor of Kansas here, King Day, uh, McGuire and them, we don't aspire to be poor. We aspire to be successful. They aspire to look poor, because they got a trust fund, so when they get through acting up and carrying on, they go back home, take a bath, and get their trust fund and go on. We ain't got no trust fund. So don't confuse why mama needed to believe in God and Jesus helped get her out that hole. With you having a guaranteed life that we never had. And in fact, some of your trust fund is inherited from your grandparents and their parents, which meant our great grandparents helped work and then get paid, which helped fatten your trust fund. Now you're going to try to take my roots from me when your fruits come from those that are in my roots. Now, you don't have to believe the same way I believe. You don't have to worship the same way I worship. But don't deny me. And that's why I said last week when we got in when I was dealing with the black church thing. Don't defame something that's not true. Well, with Reverend, I, I, I like what you do, but I disagree with Christianity's white man's religion. That's a lie. Tell him, Reverend. You can go do whatever you want to be. But white folks didn't start Christianity. And white folks didn't teach us Christianity for the first time. 20% of those that were brought over here from Africa as slaves were Catholics. Another 20% was Muslim. Don't act like all of us was the same thing. The master taught his form of Christianity to us. We turn around and Africanized his form of Christianity because we already knew it. That's why you got gospel music. You don't hear gospel music in their form of Christianity because they did not come from the beat of the drum. When we got through with their form of Christianity, they didn't know what it was. But anything to divide us. Here you are, and here I am, descendants of slaves. And we're going to have an argument with each other rather than argue about slavery. And then in Christianity, y'all argue. I'm a Baptist. I'm an A of me. I'm a C of me. I'm a U of me. I'm Kojic. I'm fire baptized. I'm holy fire baptized. I'm super baptized. I mean, you got all these different corporations. The objective is to do right and to live right. Whatever you're going to call yourself. I've been baptized with immersion. I've been baptized with sprinkling. I've been, well, you need to go back again. Because you got too much wickedness and pettiness in you. So I want y'all to watch this because. The significance of our black church was that the first institution, Reverend Lewis, that we ever 
owned and operated was the black church. Right out of slavery. The only thing we owned and operated was our church. When we started electing officials, and I'm going to talk to them about voting rights as part of our Black History Month series. When we started electing black officials, three of the first four we sent to Washington was preaching because they were leaders in the community. Now, when, let me go to the second part of this problem, is that a lot of us criticize the church and criticize voting. Well, I ain't part of the system. First of all, everybody here and listening to me, are in, you're in the system. Quit telling yourself you ain't in the system. If you eat food, bought in a store, whether you cooked it or not, it was FDA approved, which means you eating system approved food. If you get in a car, the car was approved by the system. You driving approved by the system with your driver's license. You stop at the red or green light because the system put the lights up there. Quit playing with us that you ain't in the system. Sitting up getting a social security check. Talking about you a revolutionary out of the system, but you waiting on your check. So, if you are that involved, then you ought to at least exercise a voting ability to decide which Social Security going to be. Let's welcome our Impact TV family watching all over the world. They had the Civil War. Black History Month. Civil War happened. North versus South. And I told you last week how Lincoln was convinced by the abolitionists and his generals to free the slaves in the slave states. Had them join the Union Army, and it was because those slaves, or those enslaved, I prefer saying, joined the Union Army, they had the muscle power to push back the Confederates. Don't forget the Confederates had gotten as far north as Virginia which meant that they weren't far out of Washington, D.C. What pushed them back was that they had freed enough of us that we fought them back. When the Union Army finally defeated the Confederates and they conceded defeat, Lincoln had promised that if they won, he was going to enfranchise the slave. That's where all of this comes from about Lincoln and the slaves and, and Lincoln's promise and commitment. That's where the discussion of 40 acres and a mule came from, which Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee reintroduced a reparations bill this week. Lincoln, therefore, in following up his commitment, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, 1863. The Emancipation Proclamation promised at midnight, January 1st, that the enslaved could walk off the plantation free. Midnight, December 31st, they waited for the strike, for the clock to strike 12 to see if Lincoln would keep his promise. That's where the watch night service started in the black church. Y'all go to watch night, don't understand what watch night is. Watch night was not 
just a night for us to be sitting around talking about nothing. Watch night was not just a time to have church service. We used to have service and at 12 o'clock come, five after 12, the church be empty because y'all left the watch night service to go to the party. I never understood that. Negro shouting and hooping and flipping in the Holy Spirit at 10 to 12. And twerking at the quarter after 12. I'll tell you what twerking mean later, y'all there. That's a new school thing, you know. Watch night was, were we going to be freed? That's why, a hundred years later, Ponder, yes, sir. that when they had the March on Washington, 1863 to 1963, hundred years later, that's why they went and had the march at Lincoln's Memorial. It's black history, y'all. Y'all never understood why the march was there hundred years later. If you read Dr. King's speech, and not just the end, I have a dream part. He says in the speech, we come because you promised, Mr. Lincoln. That's why they didn't go to the Jefferson Memorial or the Washington Monument, because they didn't promise us nothing. Y'all taking off work Monday, celebrating President's Day, they didn't promise you nothing. You promised. And King said, a hundred years later, we've not gotten our full freedom. But he did sign the Emancipation Proclamation, and we did get off the plantation. They had the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment made everyone born of the country citizens, full citizenship. That should have automatically gave us the enfranchisement of full citizenship, which included voting. That's why I tell people that get into this in my opinion, diversionary argument, well, y'all with civil rights, I'm with human rights. I'm not for civil rights, I'm for human rights. I'm for both. Why are you arguing about civil rights and human rights trying to be rhetorically slick? First of all, you go out to JFK International Airport, anybody lands here from another country should have human rights but they're not a citizen, they don't have civil rights. I am both a human and a citizen. That's why there was a civil rights movement. It was for a movement of those that were citizens that were disenfranchised of their civil rights. Folk coming here from foreign countries couldn't fight for their civil rights. They didn't have civil rights. They had human rights because they were not citizens of this country. We were in a position where we were denied our right to vote even though the 14th Amendment said since we were born here, we were in the fourth generation of slavery. So we were born here. If we're full citizens, we should be able to vote. They came back with the 15th Amendment, saying that all citizens had the right to vote and you couldn't disenfranchise them. Is that the 14th and 15th Amendment? When that was enforced, we put 22 people black in the US Congress and Senate. We started electing blacks all over the country. Lincoln was killed by a Confederate sympathizer, John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln went to the play, man shot him right as he sat in his box. He was succeeded by Andrew Johnson. Y'all follow me now. Andrew Johnson was his vice president. Lincoln had chose Johnson 
as an appeasement to the South and the Southern states' rights people. What they call it, balancing the ticket. Usually a presidential candidate tries to get somebody to run with him that helps him in areas that he may not be as strong. That's why when President Obama ran, he got Biden because Biden had been in the Senate a long time and could help him with the senators because Obama had just been in the Senate two years. And it proved wise because Biden helped work the senators to get the Affordable Care Act passed because he had the relationships going back 30 years. That's why I keep telling y'all, if you only hang out with folks that you always hung out with, you never expand your domain because you're talking to the same folk. You got to be able to deal with people that ain't just like you. So you learn how to deal with an expanding base. I don't need folk organizing that just organize themselves. I get on uh, the chapter here, Brother Griffith and Katrina and them every other day. Talking about how many new members or chapter president uh, committee members bring it in. I'm the head of the so-and-so committee. How many members you got? Four. Two years later, how many members you got? Four. Well, y'all ain't got a committee. Y'all got a little powwow going. <laughs> Sit around talking to yourself. That's why I, I see some of these activists. Call a march and ain't nobody there but them. That's a walk. That ain't a march. You need a crowd to have a march. You going for a stroll. So he put Johnson there. When Johnson became president, Johnson backed up on all of what Lincoln had committed. Because he was compromised because he believed in the state's rights. So what he did was they let the states decide voting procedure. You got the right to vote, but the state's going to tell you how you can vote. And that's when we began losing our voting power. Because Georgia had one set of rules, and Mississippi another set of rules, Louisiana. And they all came with all these schemes to disenfranchise us from voting. By the turn of the century, by the time we got to 1900, there were no blacks left in Congress. None in the Senate. And the Ku Klux Klan had rose and they were terrorizing blacks. And we went all the way through the early parts and middle parts of the 20th century with no real exercise of the right to vote because of the state laws barred that. It was only in some northern states that we had enough numbers that we could outdo whatever impediments they had and elect people anyhow. This voting rights movement. Now, that's why in Illinois in the 40s, they elected William Dawson, first black in Congress since Reconstruction, William Dawson in Chicago. Secondly, they elected a city councilman in New York to Congress named Adam Clayton Powell Jr. And on and on. It was why Dr. King and the Southern Movement said that we need a Voting Rights Act. Why do we need a Voting Rights Act? Again, some of y'all talk more than y'all read. Voting Rights Act gave us the right to vote. Why we the only one needed the Voting Rights Act the right to vote? Voting Rights Act did not give you the right to vote. Thirteen. 14th and 15th Amendment gave you the right to vote. The Voting Rights Act protected the right. And the reason we had to have it is no one else needed the protection like we did. Let me tell you something. I believe in working with all people that have bias against it. Work with 
Greeks, work with Jews, work with uh, Latinos, everybody. But the only ones that written law was against was us. It was the law that we were three-fifths of a man. It was the law that blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. It was the law that we couldn't drink from the same water fountain. Water fountain said whites only, colored only. It was the law we couldn't go check in a hotel. So we needed special law because we were the victims of special law. That's why all these people talk about affirmative action is wrong. I'm not responsible for my great grandfather, my grandmother, what they did. I never had no slaves, but you benefited from it. <laughs> Only reason you are ahead is you inherited an advantage, and I inherited a disadvantage. And the only way you gonna catch that up is we gotta reconfigurate the social landscape. Y'all watched the Super Bowl last week, some of y'all. The only reason, I said it on my show, only reason that people can be entertained with a Super Bowl game or a football game is if you both sides, both teams have the same amount of yards, same rules, same referee decisions, same amount of, of downs they have, same amount of quarters. They don't give one team more advantage than the other. That's why it makes it work, because it's an even playing field. All we are fighting for is an even playing field. If you give us an even playing field, we'll win the game. When we say don't choke us to death like Eric Garner, treat us like you treat folk and Benson her. Well, you know, they say Eric had Lucy's. Well, you got folk out in Benson Hurst doing all kinds of stuff. You don't choke them to death, even playing field. But George Floyd, they say, had a counterfeit $20 bill, never proved it. But if he did, treat him like he's doing the other side of Minneapolis. We ain't asking for favors, even playing field. So all the way up till we get to 1960s, in the South, they did not rescind the 14th and 15th Amendment. They just used the state laws to keep us from easily exercising. So you would go in and say, I come to vote, I have the right to vote. 14th, 15th Amendment, give me the right to vote. Oh, sure, you can vote. But uh, you got to pass this state test. Okay. Question one, there's a jar of jelly beans there. How many jelly beans in that jar? Oh, I don't know. Fail. Uh, question two, uh, Mildred Fillmore was president of the United States. What was his wife's name? I don't know. Fail. They would come with stuff like that to deny you the right to vote. State elections board. They would put voting sites in areas that they lived and blacks didn't live. So you got to go way across town to vote and even then be denied. That is what the voting rights movement was about, to make a way to neutralize state law. That's why Andrew Young, who was an aide to Dr. King, told the story that when they got the Civil Rights Act of 64, Civil Rights Act 64 ended public accommodations bias by federal law, meaning everywhere in the country you were able to ride the bus where you wanted and stay in hotels and all of that. They invited Dr. King to the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And as Dr. King and the others were standing around, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, and 
he'd hand the pen to certain dignitaries around. He handed Dr. King his pen. And Dr. King and him spoke after, and he said, I know you're happy, Dr. King. We finally got the vote of the uh, Civil Rights Act through. He said, stay in touch with me. He said, Dr. King, just Andrew Young, tell him, sir. Dr. King said, yeah, but now we need a voting rights act. And Dr. King looked at Johnson when he said it. Johnson said, wait a minute, I just used all my political currency. I used all my connections, all my relationships to get the Civil Rights Act. I don't think we can get a voting rights act. I can't go back to the Congress now with another race bill. Dr. King and Andrew Young walked on out the White House. When they got on the steps, Andrew Young said, boy, did you hear what the president said? Dr. King said, yeah. He said, what are we going to do? He said he can't get a voting rights act. He said, we go back down south and make him get it. That's where Selma came from. Mm, that's right. They went to Selma because they had started a voting rights movement around the South. A young man in Marion, Alabama, Jimmy Lee Jackson, was killed trying to fight for voting rights. I preached at the church where his funeral was in Marion. Marion was the home city of Coretta Scott King. That's where she was born and raised. The killing of J Jimmy Lee Jackson led to Jane Lawrence and others that were active in the SCLC movement of Dr. King to say we're going to walk from Selma to Montgomery and protest our not having voting rights. Now some of y'all went a few years ago, we reenacted the march and we marched those 55 miles taking about a mile or two a day. You that went or that have ever been know that you could drive from Selma to Montgomery in about an hour. If Rachel or Dominique's driving, you get there in 35 minutes. But people that do the speed limit, it take about an hour. So why did they march and go two miles a day, rest, and wait till the next day? Because the King School of Activism was to learn how to dramatize and bring attention. Because if you turn up the attention, it puts pressure on those in power. So they got ready to do this Selma to Montgomery March. They were gonna start that Sunday. They meet at Brown Chapel, AME Church. They march out to church. They're going two by two. So they have a long line. First leaders of it was Reverend Hosea Williams, field director for Dr. King. Next to him, John Lewis. Amelia Boynton who was the mother of the movement in Selma, and was one from Selma, was right behind them. And they start marching to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Edmund Pettus was a Ku Klux Klan's leader. The very bridge was named after the Klan. And as they started marching over the bridge, when they got to the top of the bridge, there was Alabama State Troopers. They told them to turn around and go back to the church. They stood there, and the troopers charged, and that's where you see the historic tape of them being tear gassed and beaten. And even in that, Lewis, they act like John Lewis was the only one beat. They beat him, they tear gassed and beat Amelia Boynton. There's always been this misogyny in the movement where they act like the woman getting beat don't mean nothing. Amelia Boynton was tear gassed and beat. Hosea Williams beat. And the footage from that, 
went on the evening news. When people saw people being beaten for the right to vote, people started flying in everywhere, from everywhere, to continue to march from Selma to Montgomery. Dr. King wasn't there that Sunday. He was at his home church. He and his father co-pastored Ebenezer. When he heard about the beating, he drove about three hours into Selma, and they picked up the march. When they got to Montgomery, by then the whole world was outraged with the savagery of what they had done. That is what led to them bringing a Voting Rights Act to Congress, and in 65, got the Voting Rights Act. Without a movement and the drama, you don't get the results. That's why when we stood August 28, 2020 in Washington where King stood 57 years later and brought all the families, it is the drama of our march. 200,000 people in the middle of a pandemic that will lead to the George Floyd bill going in front of the Senate because we put our feet on the ground and show drop. It's because we kept marching for five years that we have an Eric Garner law in the state of New York. That's why Cuomo gave Gwen and all us the pen. If we had not marched in Staten Island, there wouldn't be no Eric Garner bill. If you don't know how to raise the issue, if you don't know how to dramatize the pain, you get no results. Why y'all always rallying? Why y'all always marching? Because ain't nobody going to come hear you unless you make yourself heard. Voting Rights Act in 65. Three years later, we start getting blacks in the Senate. First one, Ed Brooke from Massachusetts. We started expanding the Congress, blacks. Started getting black mayors. 67, Carl Stokes elected in Cleveland, Ohio. Voting doesn't solve all of our problems, but what it does solve, we need. If you are in a ditch, you don't sit there and talk about, I want somebody to take me all the way out or I'm going to sit here. If somebody got to take me out an inch at a time, I'm going to use whatever inches I got. <laughs> Voting brings us closer to where we need to be. Now, if people fought tear gas, beaten, killed. Two Jews and a black went down to join the voting rights movement, Goodman, Cheney, and Swerner. They killed them, mowed them down. With their eyes open, killed them, put them in a ditch in Mississippi to give us the right to vote. Italian woman left Michigan and went down to help join the voting rights movement. Viola Luisa. Kill that woman for fighting to give us the right to vote. Kill students all over Georgia. Give us the right to vote. And here you are, 50 years later, sitting up in New York, Chicago, Detroit, wherever you're watching me from. Nobody trying to mow you down. Nobody tear gassing you. Nobody got a baton whipping you on a bridge. You just too lazy and ungrateful. <laughs> to go take an hour to decide who's going to decide on who's going to run your kids' schools. Yeah. Your kids. Yeah. The babies you laid down in half. Yeah. 
you just going to give them to the system because you ain't going to vote about it. The power that we get from that, we ought not take for granted. Nobody would fight to take something from us if it wasn't a bank. The fact that they spent so much effort and time to stop us from voting or to tell you it must be worth something. A thief don't steal anything that is not of value. Thief got enough sense to say, if I can't pawn it, I don't want it. If all you got in your house is crates and no furniture and no jewelry, a thief would be disappointed breaking in your house. They're looking for something of value. Why do these people come with all these schemes? Change in voting sites in Georgia, change in voter sites in Mississippi, changing the rules all over the country, voter ID, got to have photo picture ID. The reason they come with that is because they know if we exercise the right to vote, it's the difference between a Trump and a Biden. Is a difference between a Pence or a black woman named Kamala Harris. That's why they spend their time. So in the 21st century, we sitting up in a courtroom, the Supreme Court. They have an argument before the Supreme Court against the Attorney General Eric Holder called Shelby versus Holder. Attorney Michael Hardy and I are in the audience sitting watching the oral arguments. John Lewis is in the audience. Martin Luther King III, all of us going because they're trying to overturn the Voting Rights Act. Well, the Voting Rights Act set up that any state or any county that had a pattern of voter discrimination, they could not change their requirements to vote, their state law, going back to Andrew Johnson, without having pre-clearance by the Justice Department in Washington. All of the southern states had to pre-clear. That was part of the map. There were two counties in New York that was part of the Voting Rights Act, which means if they wanted to ask for vote ID, had to first get that approved in Washington. If they wanted to move voting sites, had to first get that approved in Washington. If they wanted to do this, that, or other in Georgia, first get that approved in Washington. That's what the Voting Rights Act did. Didn't give you the right to vote. It meant they couldn't change the rules on you. Shelby versus Holder was to try to remove the Voting Rights Act. We were in the courtroom, sitting up in the Supreme Courtroom. When they argued the case, i never forget it. Judge Scalia said during the oral arguments that voting rights sound to me like a racial entitlement. We were sitting right there. I got ready to say something, they say you're not allowed to talk in the Supreme Court. You gotta respect the sanctity of the Supreme Court. I should get some of them Supreme Court guards here, people walk, talk, do everything while I'm talking. Yeah. They will come late and come walk to the front. Late folks in the back. That's an after the broadcast meeting, but I, the Supreme Court decorum reminded me of that. So even I shut up when he said racial entitlement. They come back with a decision from the court, and they said, well, we won't reverse the whole Voting Rights Act. We're just going to take out certain amendments 
And what they took out was section four and five, which took out the map, which meant the whole country now could do whatever changes they want because there was no designated areas that was required to pass their changes in Washington. So what they said was, we didn't end the Voting Rights Act. Y'all give us a new map. This map is outdated. Because we didn't control the Congress, we couldn't get a new map through the Congress, which is what we are doing now with the John Lewis Voting Protection Bill. I want y'all to understand what this is, so y'all know what we fight. The John Lewis Protection Act, Voter Protection Act, that we marched on August 28th, two bills we said, y'all heard my speech, is we want the George Floyd bill and the John Lewis bill. The John Lewis bill is to put the map back in. Well, who should be on the map? If you listen to me, it'd be all 50 states. But they must put in the map of those that have the pattern of voter denial. Since Shelby versus Holder took the map out, that's how they closed the voting sites in Georgia to beat Stacey uh, Abrams. They couldn't have done that if Georgia was still under the map. That's how they have voter ID in Texas, where if you got Vote, uh, a photo of your gun license, you can vote. But if you got a photo of you going to state university, you can't vote. But they took the map out. We've got to pass this legislation. We voted, but more Democrats in the House and the Senate, now we got to get this done now. That is why we vote. That's why when we had this virtual meeting with Biden and Harris, I brought up, somebody leaked the tape, good, look at what we say. I brought up the George Floyd bill and the John Lewis bill. We didn't vote for y'all because we like y'all. We vote for y'all because we like ourselves. I'm all right with me, but I ain't running around this country trying to get people to vote because I'm all right with Kamala. I wanted people in power that would keep us empowered. Yeah. Well, now, who you like for mayor this year? It ain't about who I like. It's who's going to do the best job for us. We in a pandemic. We can't even get the vaccines distributed fairly. Cuomo come out this week addressing racial inequities in the vaccine. You run around talking about, I don't believe in taking a vaccine. Ain't nobody brought it to you. Y'all run around debating like y'all got some vaccines. Remember Trotsky, what are you talking about? We're trying to get the stuff in here. We can debate it once it is equally distributed. Let folk make up their mind what they want to do. I remember me and my sister was cutting up doing something wrong. My mother told us, go to your room. Y'all in the punishment. It's about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. By 5.30 comes, she said, dinner time, y'all come out. My sister gonna throw a boycott. She mad because she was punished. She said, I ain't eating. I said, I am. <laughs> Frank, you don't want to eat, it's more for me. You don't want a vaccine, fine, step aside. But bring it all here so we can get it if we want it.
I told a friend of mine, I, I have many questions to anybody else, but I done seen three million people take it, and they ain't dying, so I'm leaning that way. Talking about, I ain't taking no vaccine. I talked to you later. You be talking to me through a screen and some window pane. Mask ain't enough. I'm gonna be talking to folk like we in jail. What, what's them things where you talk through the glass cage? Cause they talking about they got a new strain out here. Our power to vote can't be underestimated. And that's why I wanted to give that lesson today in black history. Cause we don't understand. It was that power to vote that gave us an Adam Craig power. That gave us a Shirley Chisholm. That gave us a Barack Obama. And because we had them, Adam Craig Powell put model cities through commerce. Minimum wage through commerce. Went to the Bandung Conference and, and dealt Kazembe with the Pan-African movement. Cause we put him in power. Shirley Chisholm put educational laws on the book. Barack Obama put health care where 23 million people got health care that never got it. Cause we could vote. That's why I'm saying to you, and I let you go, all of us need to do our role. It's in the Bible. When Jer when Nehemiah uh -huh. saw the walls of Jerusalem yeah. had been torn down, he was a servant in another land. And when he heard the walls were torn down, he asked the king that he was serving to let me go back home to rebuild the walls. Why rebuild the walls? The walls of Jerusalem represented the strength and the power and the fortress of Jerusalem. Yeah. And if I can get back and help rebuild the wall, it will rebuild the self-identity and the empowerment of my people. Yeah. I want to rebuild the wall because people are acting and operating any kind of way because the walls are down. They're not respecting the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because the walls are down. They're violating our daughters because the walls are down. When he got in there, they said, how are we going to rebuild the wall? Nehemiah didn't say, give me an architect. Just everybody get in your place and build right in front of you. If everybody stand in their place and build their part of the wall, we will rebuild the wall. Well, I come to tell you the walls are down in black America. The walls are down. We lost off many of our small businesses in the pandemic. The walls are down. We got people that won't come out and vote over the schooling of their own children. The walls are down. We got black men locked up in jail, three to one ratio, getting sentences four to one. The walls are down. Got our women making the news, not for achievement, but putting glue in the wings. And you following women with glue in a wig, rather than following Stacey Abrams trying to empower you, the walls are down. <laughs> Grown men standing up in recording studios, studios that Aretha used to sing respect, studios that James Brown used to sing black and proud. And they in them studios calling us niggas and calling our women bitches. The walls are down. It's time to rebuild the walls. It's time to rebuild our dignity. It's time to rebuild our self-respect. It's time to rebuild our self-esteem. It's time.
to rebuild the wall. If my people called by my name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then, right then, I don't care what Trump say, right then, you will hear from heaven. I will heal the land. I will heal the land. I will heal the land. There's power, wonder working power. In the blood of the land. But what does that mean, Shopton? Well, it was the power of Jesus' sacrifice yeah, yeah. that told us that even if you've got a sacrifice, that I will give power from your sacrifice. Sometimes God requires sacrifice for you to get your reward. It's power in the blood. Power in those that have shed blood for cause. They bled on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But that bleed led to a Barack Obama putting his hand on the Bible. They bled in Mississippi. But today, young white girls is looking at a black woman vice president. There's power. Wonder working power in the blood. There is power. someone here today in the auditorium that never joined National Action Network. You might listen to us on the radio. You might see some of our work on the TV news, but never became a part of the organization. If you're here today and want to join, just come down to me and let us sign you up right now. You should not leave Black History Month without being a member of an organization fighting for our people. If you're here, just come down to me, let us sign you up. If you're listening by radio or watching on Impact Television, you can call right now, 
4651-1877-626-4651. Everybody sing. Everybody sing. Before we go off, we're about to go off the air. I want to make this appeal, you that have called and joined in, but you that are listening, that have never contributed to National Action Network, there's no better time than right now during Black History Month for you to go right now to www.nationalactionnetwork.net, nationalactionnetwork.net, and you can give right online. Or if you find it difficult to work with social media or getting online, you can call 877-626-4651-1877-626-4651 and contribute as we go off the air. Glad to our Minister Music Brother Richardson to give us a selection and we get ready for our offering here. Let's go off the air with some music.
big hand. All right, let's take our offering. We're going to take our offering, taking our new